Ready? Oh, ready? Hello, everyone. Um, uh, good morning. And it's so lovely to actually see everyone in person, even though we're quite far apart. But it's lovely to see you all. Hello. Um, I'm, if, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Irma Ranieri, Commissioner for Public Sector Employment. Um, IPA partners and supporters, thank you and welcome to the ICAC Address to the Public Sector, Integrity and Accountability in Public Administration. And a very warm welcome to those people who are joining us virtually. I think there's about 170 people, more than here, that are actually uh, online, so hello to everyone. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that the land that we meet on today is the traditional land of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. Um, we have got Tiana Sylvie um, to do a special welcome uh, to country. Tiana's stuck somewhere on King William Street. Who's noticed the amount of traffic Adelaide has at the moment? Wonderful thing. So when Tiana gets here, we will get her to do that special, special welcome. I'll keep going with the acknowledgements. Firstly, I'd like to welcome our new ICAC Commissioner, the Honourable Anne Vanstone QC. Thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate you providing your valuable time to deliver your address to the South Australian Public Service, and I believe it's the first one. Is that correct? To, yep, good. There's a first for IPA. I'd like to acknowledge IPA's major partners, the State Government of South Australia's Senior, Ma Senior Management Council members, PWC, Flinders University and Australia Post. We also acknowledge IPA's professional members and councillors. Today's Twitter hashtag is hashtag ICA, ICAC, SA. I should have said that all in one word. Um, and today the questions for the panel session will be done as we normally do through Slido. Um, we'd like you to submit your questions by scanning the QR code with your smartphones or tablets, by entering the website www.slido.com into your web browser and entering the code L887. And uh, for those of you that have been to events before, we've done this before. We won't probably be able to get to all the questions, but what we will do is try and um, consolidate them and make sure that we get through as many things that you want to ask as we can. I'm going to continue uh, with my introductions. I'd like to um, give you a bit of background uh, to our Commissioner, the Honourable Anne Vanstone QC, former Supreme Court Justice. Um, she began her seven-year term as the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption in September last year. A Queen's Counsel, she served on the bench of South Australia's Supreme Court for 17 years and was the third woman in the state to hold this position. Well done. During that time, she was particularly known for her work in the Criminal Appeals Division of the Court and for her knowledge and writing in the Rules of Evidence. Commissioner Vanstone is also South Australia's Judicial Conduct Commissioner and carries out the role concurrently with her duties within ICAC. We'll get uh, Commissioner Vanstone to do her address um, and then after that, um, we will get uh, uh, Carolyn Melor, the Chief Executive of the Attorney General's Department, to conduct um, a Q&A with the Commissioner uh, with your questions. I think Caroline's got some up her sleeve as well. Is that right? So she's all prepared for that. Um, I haven't got an introduction and a bio for you, Carolyn, but I would have loved one. So uh, she's one of my colleagues on the Senior Management Council um, and does her job extremely well, and I'm very proud to call her one of my colleagues. So um, thank you, Caroline. I think that what we'll do, have we got no, not here. I think we will go straight into the address um, and then uh, once we have Tiana here, we might get her to do the welcome afterwards so we don't delay people, in particular those people that we're, we're streaming live. So, Commissioner, please um, come and address and then we'll get us uh, doing the Q&A. Please, a round of applause for the Commissioner. Thank you, Irma. Good morning, everyone in the room, and good morning to those who are viewing from uh, other places. And thank you for attending today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. I've been asked to address you on the topic of integrity and accountability in public administration. 
I'll attempt to do that, although admittedly it's no easy or straightforward task. Integrity and accountability are terms frequently used in public sector circles, and public officers, from the store person to the team leader to the chief executive, are repeatedly reminded of these obligations. Have integrity, they say. Be accountable, we are told. What do these terms actually mean? What do they require? How do we give effect to them? And most importantly, what happens when they go missing? My guess is the true meaning and import of integrity and accountability are obscured through frequent and, at times, indiscriminate use. Words used too often can be poorly grasped and drained of meaning. These ideas are often invoked much in the way one swipes a debit card to pay for a morning coffee, mechanically, instinctively, unconsciously. We can use them without really thinking about the resources and reserves they rely on. And like a too often swiped debit card, if we use them too carelessly or pay them only lip service, we can easily find ourselves with an integrity and accountability deficit. Thankfully, forums like this exist to give us pause to consider again what is required of us to have a public administration that acts with integrity and accountability. Before I attempt to re-examine the overworked terms, integrity and accountability, allow me to digress to say a bit about my office. The organisation is over seven years old and I'm its second commissioner, almost six months into the seven year term. Though the organisation is now well established and reasonably well known by the public, if not perhaps well understood, the job of instilling ICAC awareness among public officers like you is an ongoing task. It's not well understood that there is no commission as such. I'm a commissioner with a staff of over 70 people to help me in the role. That includes the staff of the Office of Public Integrity, which we call the OPI, some of whom are here today, which is responsible to me. The OPI is the clearinghouse for all complaints about corruption, misconduct and maladministration that might be occurring in public administration, including local councils, universities, even contractors to the government. The OPI also oversees investigations into police conduct, but I won't mention that function again today. As you all know, or I hope you know, public officers have a statutory obligation to report to the OPI any reasonable suspicions they have of corruption or serious or systemic misconduct and maladministration. You essentially are our eyes and ears. In most cases, we hear about potential corruption from people like you. Most complaints come in by phone, or through a form filled in online. Most of the staff of ICAC and the OPI are legally trained, including those who take complaints over the telephone. They're also trained in dealing sympathetically with those who ring in. They assess the complaints received and either decide what course of action should be taken or make recommendations to me about the appropriate course of action. We take no action on a large number of complaints due to perhaps a lack of meaningful information or the matter already being dealt with elsewhere or the matter being trivial or sometimes vexatious. Many we refer back to the agency itself to manage on their own, usually with directions, and sometimes we require them to report back to us on the result of the investigation they conduct and the findings they made. Some matters are referred to the Ombudsman, others to the South Australia Police. Only a fraction of the over 1,200 complaints against public officers received each year are investigated by my office. I have a group of investigators who investigates, investigate those allegations assessed as potential corruption, which by definition in the ICAC Act is criminal conduct within public administration. 
Then there's a small team of legal officers who support the investigators and me. And I also have various specialists, intelligence analysts and the like. Apart from that, I have research officers who educate and evaluate agencies regarding corruption risks and prevention. And this is a really important section. It touches hundreds of public officers. Our evaluations are ultimately welcomed by the agencies uh, to which we um, subject to an, an evaluation as they learn how they can make valuable changes to their systems. For example, ICAC has conducted an evaluation of the Public Trustee, Safe Work SA, the Playford Council and other agencies. And I have a corporate services section comprised of finance, business, human resources and ICT officers. And as you can imagine, our ICT systems are fairly sophisticated. So that's a brief snapshot of my office. Why do I tell you this? Because for many, ICAC is a closed book. And I think it's time we became more public about our purpose and our functions. And I hope you have to say more about our work in the coming months and years. My predecessor, the Honourable Bruce Lander QC, had the challenging task of setting up an entirely new organisation from the ground up. That was no doubt a demanding task. I recently told the parliamentary committee that oversees our work that what I found when I commenced in the role in September was a very well organised and well run office. I told them that I'm extremely impressed with the culture of the office. The staff is a group of committed, diligent, smart individuals who respect the organisation and its charter, and they operate with great integrity. If South Australians knew a lot more of the office and how it's run and the sort of people who staff it, they would be very proud. I hope that everyone in this room enjoys and participates in similar cultures of integrity within their own agencies and are committed and proud of what they achieve. If not, we all have more work to do. And in that work of integrity and culture building, I wish you to know that we are your partner, not your enemy. By legislative design, as well as force of habit, South Australians do not get to know much about what ICAC is and what it does. It's fair to say that our activities are often shrouded in mystery. And like all closed and secretive organisations, we can appear remote and enigmatic and perhaps to some scary. Because so little is known about what we do and we have so few opportunities to speak candidly about our work, we are sometimes imagined to be engaging in dark and nefarious pursuits. People can be inclined to project their suppositions and misapprehensions and fears onto my office. My predecessor was fond of joking to audiences that as the anti-corruption commissioner he was repeatedly accused of being the most corrupt person in South Australia. I've only received my first accusation of being corrupt and incompetent quite recently. I was told by my staff that my initiation is complete and I can now properly call myself the ICAC. It's, it's unfortunate though that we can be perceived in this way. And as much as I'm able, I plan to dispel the mystery around my office. We are not an organisation one should fear, unless, of course, you're involved in corruption. We're not here to catch people for mere errors or mistakes or minor transgressions. Every agency and department should have the will and resources to address those problems without worrying about our intervening. We're only interested when integrity failings are so grave that criminal conduct is occurring or may occur. No one wants criminals and those conspicuously lacking in integrity working alongside them. No one looks for that. Such individuals can devastate the working culture and the operations of agencies. We should all be able to agree that their conduct needs to be detected, exposed and dealt with. You are best placed to expose such conduct. I'm here to deal with it. 
The ICAC is a partner to you and your agencies in the maintenance and, when necessary, repair of integrity in our public administration. With any luck, more openness and accountability from us will help dispel any misunderstanding of our role and foster more trust that we're all working towards the same goals. I've already witnessed the level of hyperbole and extravagance which the ICAC can inspire in public commentary. Because our ability to speak openly to the public is restricted, it's often the case that when we do divulge something about ourselves, people wrongly assume the worst. I'll give you an example of the types of fearful overreaction and embellishment to which we can be subject. I outline this example both to be more transparent about the nature of our office, but also to give you a taste of what I regard as integrity and accountability in action. Obviously, the ICAC has considerable powers to conduct our investigations into corruption. For example, in limited and highly regulated circumstances, we can use surveillance devices under the provisions of the Surveillance Devices Act. Late last year, my office received some negative publicity regarding an error made in the installation of some of these devices during the course of a corruption investigation. Before I outline the particulars of the error, let me tell you something about the publicity. The revelation that there had been an error in the installation of the devices was variously described as troubling, extremely disappointing, an unprecedented and potentially scandalous revelation. It raised many serious questions relating to the legality of the listening device, was a potential abuse of power, and raised questions about my investigators' conduct and whether they had crossed the line. To speak plainly, it was none of those things. There was no scandal. I go back a step. On the basis of sworn evidence of one of my investigators, the Supreme Court issued a warrant enabling the installation of surveillance devices for the purpose of an ICAC investigation. The circumstances, limitations and conditions for the use of those devices were clearly stipulated on the warrant. So just to go over that, an investigator swears an affidavit, takes it before a Supreme Court judge in a private hearing with a, one of our legal officers. The Supreme Court judge has read all the material in advance, understands the purpose for which the uh, warrant is sought, understands what background has led to that, and then decides whether to grant the warrant. The judge can ask questions of the legal officer or the investigator to flesh out the application. And then the judge, if he's minded or she's minded, grants the warrant and puts on it such limitations and conditions as he or she thinks fit. Now, on this warrant, the devices could only record when a certain person of interest was in a room in a certain building. So it's quite restricted, and it stipulated the number of devices. We ourselves do not install these devices. We don't have the necessary expertise or capacity. So that service is provided by another agency, either in South Australia or outside South Australia. So the meeting that we were trying to capture took place and the devices had been installed and useful evidence was gained. But the meeting was then adjourned to another time and the next day and another meeting room. The devices needed to be relocated to capture what was then said. We instructed the agency to do that. However, they didn't have time to retrieve the original devices. As you can imagine, that's done covertly and it has to be done very carefully with constraints. So instead of retrieving the original devices, they disabled them. And in the, in the second meeting room, they installed new devices. So these developments occurred rapidly. However, once we were told of what had been done, it was immediately recognised that the new configuration no longer conformed with the terms of the warrant. 
There were too many devices in the building, albeit that some were disabled. To maintain the integrity of the investigation, the, the, these steps were taken. The product from those devices in the second meeting room was ordered to be immediately quarantined from us, as well as, as, well as any notes made by the agency which installed them. So any material gathered was not viewed or used by ICAC. Then the Justice of the Supreme Court who had issued the warrant was notified of what had happened and the ICAC reviewer, the independent statutory officer who scrutinises our activities, was also informed of the event and what had been done to address it. In other words, we sought full accountability for the mistake. In due course, the reviewer reported this error to Parliament in his annual report. And it was then for me to give a full and frank account of these facts to the Parliamentary Committee, which also supervises our functions. So this was not some episode from a spy movie, nor was it anything like a deliberate misuse of our powers as it was presented in some quarters. Unlike the fever dreams of some, this was not an example of some shadowy cabal attempting to maliciously hide its violations and abuses from scrutiny. It was an error duly recognised, quickly acted upon and promptly and as fully as possible under our legislation disclosed and accounted for. As I told the Parliamentary Committee earlier this, uh, late last year, I can't conceive of this as anything but an exemplar of how an organisation and its individuals should act with integrity, transparency and accountability. This is all the more so when you consider this error could easily have been concealed from public view and rectified with almost no adverse consequences. This is a prime example of that old adage that ethical behaviour is doing the right thing even when no one else is watching. It may seem somewhat perverse of me to rely upon what some see as a damaging, embarrassing story about ICAC to highlight why I admire the work of the office and why I believe the ICAC is vital to the health of public administration. You might think it con contradictory to present error and mistake as a sign of our trustworthiness. But you can only show you are trustworthy and that you, um, you are properly entrusted with the powers you're given when challenges regarding your use of them present themselves. The test of people's integrity comes not through their successes, but when we are presented with failure or challenge or temptation and when matters are at a low ebb. Some people blanch before their mistakes, see them as a threat to their integrity, do nothing and tell no one. Some people cover over their mistakes, others pass the buck. But integrity means facing up to them squarely, not as threats to your reputation, if revealed, but as tests of your character, enabling you to show you are courageous enough to be accountable for them. Anyone can be a hero when things are going well. But it's the unsung acts of everyday reliability, credibility and accountability that imbue public administration with the integrity it needs. I'm given significant powers to hold to account those who may choose to misuse or abuse their public office. Those powers have been, been given so ICAC can deal with those public officers who would seek to use public powers entrusted to them for personal gain against the public interest. And I have faith that my officers are up to the task of properly using those powers. I provided the account of our surveillance device error precisely to flesh out the notions of integrity and accountability. I shouldn't think the example I've pre presented here is likely to be one that you will experience, at least I hope you're not secretly installing surveillance devices at your workplace. If you are, then the investigators might knock at your door. But I'm certain that all of you will be faced with challenges that will test your honesty, accountability and integrity. You and I are no different in that regard. 
And likewise, while you, while you might have not been entrusted with the powers I'm given, you are entrusted with public office and you've been provided with powers and resources in the public's name to undertake your roles for the public benefit. How you use those powers and manage those resources matters greatly. For example, the procurement officer who's been entrusted to score and rank contractor bids for a small procurement of cleaning services. How will that power be used with integrity? Or the asset manager who's entrusted to on-sell some surplus end-of-life computers. How will that be done in the public interest? The correctional officer who has access to the personal information of prisoners, how will he or she be accountable for the access to and use of that information? The finance officer who approves employee timesheets, how will she ensure she's approving honest accounts of time worked? The human resources director who's invited to a business meeting with her former employer, how will she manage any conflicts of interest that could emerge? The health and safety inspector who gets invited to lunch by the business owner whose premises he's just inspected, what decision will be made about the integrity of his uh, work? The senior policy officer who asked, who's asked by a ministerial advisor to delete some emails from the minister, how does she navigate that request in an ethical fashion? It's our experience that public officers do not need to have extensive powers or resources at their disposal in order to inflict great harm upon their agencies. Corruption can take root from the misuse of seemingly minor discretionary powers. All the decisions required above have the capacity to detrimentally affect the ethical health of a public authority. Indeed, the cultures of agencies are woven from the fabric of hundreds and thousands of these daily decisions. We also know that corrupt actors are emboldened and corrupt conduct is facilitated in environments characterised by maladministration. Maladministration has a specific definition in the ICAC Act, but it essentially occurs where the decision-making fabric of an organisation deteriorates. Maladministration is the ethical slippage of everyday decision-making that erodes the integrity of an agency. Once the integrity of an agency's decision-making becomes worn or strained, it doesn't take much for corruption to tear its integrity apart. For instance, what would have happened if we had not disclosed and remedied the error that I recounted to you earlier? In terms of the investigation, probably nothing. In the grand scheme of things, declining to take those actions may well have proved inconsequential. But its effect on our agency's integrity, on our people, would undoubtedly have been more pernicious. However subtle, it would have set an informal or unintended standard for others in the future in my office. Future errors might also have been weighed by the same standard and potentially covered over. If those behaviours become habitual, errors and sloppiness might eventually not be seen as such, but just as the normal way of operating. People might begin to look for workarounds to problems and challenges. Shortcuts might then turn to evasions, evasions to recklessness, to negligence, to manipulation of power. And before anyone accuses me of over-dramatising this potential corrosion of an agency's or indeed an individual's integrity and accountability, it's our experience that it's very easy for things to descend to this level. Standards that are not reiterated and lived every day can readily slip. From small things, big things grow. Let me give you an example of how that can happen. In 2019, ICAC released a report to Parliament entitled The Trusted Insider. It was an examination of two criminal pr prosecutions which resulted from ICAC investigations. One of those prosecuted was a former finance 
manager at the York Peninsula Council. Her story is sad, but it's illustrative of the slippery slope that can lead to corrupt conduct. Under financial pressure from having organised a parent's funeral and awaiting a tax return that would bring financial relief, the finance manager decided to borrow some council funds by falsifying one invoice. A day later, she received the tax return and she returned the funds back into the council's bank account, so no one noticed. A month later, she engaged in the invoice fraud again, this time returning the funds three days later. She duplicated another invoice, now returning the funds nine days later. The next time she engaged in the fraud, she did not replace the funds at all. She was caught four years later. By then, she had stolen over $200,000 from the council. This is a typical profile of fraud. It starts in a small way, exploiting some sort of risk in the processes of the uh, organisation, some sort of flaw, and if allowed to continue, it grows. Only after our report to Parliament was released did we receive further information that a former employee of the Council had apparently made complaints about the finance manager's conduct years before her fraud was detected. The complaints were a bit vague and the offender forcefully denied them and the Council was protective of its finance manager. The Council chose not to pursue the matter. The employee who made the complaint was later dismissed from their position. My advice is don't overlook small irregularities. Be accountable for all that you do in your positions of public power and for what occurs in your agencies. These, these are just some of the ingredients of that elusive notion, integrity. As I continue on this journey as Commissioner, I'm sure more ingredients of integrity will reveal themselves to me. And I'll make sure I give you as full an account of them as possible. And good luck with your demanding and important roles. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for the address, um, Commissioner. Um, for me in particular, it's really um, uh, heartening when you talk about leadership, decision making, our focus should be around the integrity of our leaders, um, and I guess how they deal with those matters, and most importantly, as public servants, we come into the public service knowing that we have a code of conduct, that we quite clearly articulate the code of ethics, um, and we went a step further and we talked about public sector values and it's only when you have conversations about what those things mean at the very local level will we keep this sort of conversation on the table. Uh, so the education program and the awareness within each ag agency and the induction of people as they come in and out of our organisations is critically important um, and it's not just something we, we speak about when we arrive um, and never talk about it as we leave. So these conversations are very important almost on a daily basis. Um, if I will ask Caroline Milo to come up to the stage. Uh, we'll start um, uh, the question time only after Tiana, who is now off King William Street, <laughs> you poor thing, um, who will do our warm welcome to country. It's a nice little interlude as well. So Tiana, I know that you've had uh, probably frustrations on the road, but we do look forward to your welcome. Sorry about that, it was um, traffic is not my forte. Um, so, Nga Mani Nai Nari, Tiana Kanado, Sylvie Williams, Nai Nai Chutaikaduna Bukiana Onoko, Puru Tandan Yanga Yathuapi, Nadlaku Wara, Pirkuna, Nunuwai Tina, Kuma, Yata, Nadlutlu, Tampanti, Yachiata, Nachuna, Bukiana ku yata kumanka mapuadlu nu. Nathu nai tuila 
Yatuku Imprenti, Nai Wanganti, Mani Naputni, Gana Yatana, Nacho Nipuna, Badniat Luwatu, Nacho Yunganandalia, Yakanandalia, Natalia. Does anyone want to have a guess what I said? No? Okay. So, hello all, how are you? My name is Tiana. I'm the third born girl in my family. Today, I would like to recognise that we meet on Ghana country. I welcome you to Ghana country. Recognise my ancestors' land, their songs, their dances, and their stories. We also greet in the spirit of place, my brothers, my sisters, my friends. Let's walk together in harmony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tiana, for that very warm welcome. Um, I'm going to hand over to Caroline now, and I believe that you have your questions that are coming through Slido, plus a few that you've prepared. So over to the panel. Thank you. These 80s chairs makes me feel rather like Parkinson, so it's a bit <laughs> exciting. Um, I do have a few questions, and then we'll move to the questions from, from the audience. Obviously, this is a, a, a rare opportunity to ask you some questions. Um, I'm interested to know that after many years practicing as a lawyer, as a prosecutor, as a barrister, and then as a jurist, what attracted you to this role? Well, that's easy. It was the investigation aspect of it. I've always been interested in investigation. Um, I think that dates back, well, certainly to my time as a prosecutor, so I think it's been mentioned. I spent 15 years as a, a Crown prosecutor. Um, started out as a fairly young lawyer in that role and ended up as the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions and it gave me the opportunity to prosecute many, many matters over the years. And that involves working closely with the police, so one gets a, a view into how investigations worked and uh, I found that fascinating. So it was that aspect of the role and that was about all I knew about the role anyway, but it was that that uh, attracted me. Yeah. And so as an investigator now, you hand over a brief to the DPP to prosecute. How do you feel about that, about not being in control of prosecution? <laughs> uh, it, it does have its moments. I acknowledge that. It's a very insightful question. And sometimes I have to correct myself that I'm, I'm not the prosecutor, I'm the investigator. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I know when I hand it over that it's going into uh, very competent hands and um, I, I get to follow it along, and of course our investigators keep having input into how it's going, and I, uh, I learn about it as it goes along. And of course the investigation doesn't necessarily stop the moment we no. hand it over, so we are very much hands-on uh, throughout. Yeah. And so, since starting, have you enjoyed it? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a fabulous job. I've enjoyed it so much, so far. Um, I know much more about it now. I, I, I used to think of it as fairly one-dimensional, but I understand now there's so much more to it. And I particularly value the fact that I've got fantastic people around me, that the work ethic among those uh, with whom I work is fantastic, and the incredibly smart people committed, and um, as I said earlier, uh, huge integrity. So uh, that, that's a joy. I mean, I'm working with experts in their fields, in, in a number of different fields too. And I've always thought that working in a uh, multidisciplinary team is fantastically um, dynamic uh, and creative and productive because we come together uh, to discuss matters and it's fantastic to see what comes out of uh, that sharing of ideas. Um, you mentioned not having a, a, a much understanding of, of the, the job or the, the role before you started. Um, has anything particularly surprised you about the role or the office since you began? I, I think the whole evaluations function uh, has surprised me. I, I just really, I had read, I suppose, about Safe Work SA and the evaluation of that, and I had read that Mr Lander wanted to do an evaluation of South SA Health, um, but I just really didn't have a, a, a clear grasp of that, and I think that's probably common to many people outside ICAC, that they don't really understand what these things mean. Um, but I see the evaluation function as a way of, um, as I've mentioned, 
reaching right into the public service, not just because there happens to be a corrupt individual there, but actually working with an agency to change its systems and improve them in terms of um, accountability and integrity and prevent corruption ever appearing. I mean, you, you can prosecute the odd individual, and of course there's a deterrent effect to that, but if you can get into the agency and identify weaknesses and rectify them, then you, potentially you, you can stave off corruption, and, and to me that's incredibly valuable. Do you think your term as ICAC will be different from the Honourable Bruce Lander's term? And are you able to articulate how that might be, if that's the case? Uh, well, the short answer is yes. Um, th there are lots of reasons for that. A as I mentioned earlier, there is no commission, so it's not just an organisation that continues on uh, and then y you have a new figurehead. Um, it's the commissioner assisted by his or her staff. So that of itself um, means that every commissioner will bring different interests and qualities to the job. And of course there's a, a broad area of discretion that the commissioner enjoys. So of course being a, a different person from Mr Lander with different background, different experiences, I won't always exercise that discretion in the same way. And as I've just mentioned, um, I think the evaluation function is so important that I, I really hope to enhance that. Um, and that would probably be uh, different from Mr Lander who perhaps concentrated most on the investigation of corruption. Um, so that, that's a difference as well. But inevitably there will be differences. I mean, I hope there are because an organisation can't just remain as it is uh, indefinitely. It needs to move and change and respond to conditions that uh, have also changed. You mentioned during your address the importance of public officers addressing misconduct when they see it and the importance of that. There's been criticism that ICAC spend, has spent too much time looking at misconduct and maladministration rather than um, for concentrating on corruption. How do you respond to that criticism? Well, it's not necessarily well-placed criticism. It's just, I think, that when Mr Lander conducted maladministration investigations, because of the structure of the Act, he was able to say more about them and he was able to re publish reports. So I think that perhaps gave the impression that a good deal of his work was in that area. But uh, that probably was not accurate, uh, that perception. Um, I mean, for example, at the moment, I have exactly zero uh, maladministration inquiries underway. Um, and I don't foresee having many in the future either and that perhaps is another difference mm. between Mr Lander and me. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it will take an exceptional matter for me to uh, want to ha uh, hold a maladministration uh, and, or misconduct hearing. It will be quite unusual. I mean, there, there are examples where I perhaps would do it. For instance, uh, everyone will remember the Oakden inquiry. I look back on that and uh, look, I haven't read the report, although I read something of the um, summaries of it. But it seemed to me that Mr Lander was able to uh, in conduct that inquiry very effectively, efficiently and quickly and to produce a, an extremely thorough report in an amazingly short amount of time. And then the report could be acted on. So I think it was terribly valuable if, if he hadn't been able to do that, then I, I think probably the, royal, uh, the, the government would have had to have um, appointed a royal commission or some other board of inquiry, and there's no statutory machinery for a board of inquiry here, unlike there is in Victoria. So I think it would have been a royal commission, and we all know how long they take and how expensive they are. So I think that was terribly valuable. valuable. And if something came up again like that, then perhaps that would persuade me that I should investigate it as a maladministration investigation. But short of the exceptional, I doubt that I will be conducting those investigations, and if I do, it will be very few, and certainly fewer than Mr Lander did. You've taken us through some of the criticism from the media and others around um, the um, surveillance device issue, but do you think that the media has a role in assisting you to 
carry out your functions and to promote the good work of your office? Uh, I do, I do. I think the media has that role in every sphere of life. I think it's a very important role. And I guess it's up to us to uh, make sure that they have the accurate information and, and try and communicate with the media when we can. And, and that is another um, wish of mine or initiative that I do want to be a little bit more um, free with the information that I impart. Of course, there are very uh, clear strictures in the Act about what I can and can't say. Um, and I have to abide by those. But again, there's probably an area of discretion within that and uh, certainly where I can I will provide public information and, um, and attempt to inform the public debate where I can and the media of course is, um, plays a huge role there. Do you think the ICAT Act is, makes the ICAT too secret? Well, it depends who you ask I guess. If you asked uh, someone who is being investigated for corruption uh, he or she would probably be quite pleased that uh, it was a secret investigation. But of course, a police investigation into corruption is secret too. Um, if you asked a, a person who had reported the matter to ICAC, they would be very pleased not to have their name bandied about. Um, and if you asked witnesses who, who spoke to ICAC about the investigation, they would be pleased to know that their names wouldn't be published. So, on the one hand, uh, there are good reasons to protect people in that way by uh, protecting their, uh, the publication of their names. On the other hand, it does create challenges, mm. as I've mentioned, and um, I'm not sure what the answer uh, is. Possibly we could be allowed to say a little more at, at the end of an investigation. That, that's another thing I want to explore, to push the limits of that if I can. But yes, there's a tension there. That's the, that's the difficulty mm. with that, that question. There's a tension between um, protecting reputation but yet keeping the public out of knowledge of what, what's happening. And have you been in the role long enough to be able to give us any observations about the level of integrity that does or doesn't exist in the public service in South Australia? Uh, I'm getting to that point, I'm not sure that I'm much of an authority on it yet. I do see a lot of uh, complaints um, assessed by the uh, OPI and so I, I get that information. And of course some agencies are mentioned over and over again and others barely rate a mention. So obviously there are likely to be problems in some agencies more than others. But um, I think there has to be maladministration, even a level of corruption in most agencies. But uh, I, I wouldn't like to be more specific at this stage. Perhaps ask me in three years. <laughs> OK, I'll see you in three years' time. <laughs> um, sort of in a similar vein, can you comment on the willingness and the capability of leaders in the public service to address misconduct and maladministration? Uh, look, from what I've seen, we have some really fantastic leaders in the in public administration. Uh, of course, there's always room for improvement and, and some leaders perhaps aren't as effective as others. So I think there is work to be done there. But by and large, I, mean, I think we have a uh, terrific public service. Um, I don't see any systemic corruption, I don't think. Um, in most agencies anyway. Most agency op agencies, I think, operate well and there is a real um, wish to advance them and make them operate better. Your office relies on public officers making reports. How would you encourage public officers to report, knowing that research suggests that people are pretty fearful of doing so? And in fact, Commissioner Lander undertook a survey about that very, one, uh, many issues, but that was one of them that showed that to be the case. Yes. I'm very sorry that that's the case, if it still is. Um, I guess I would say to someone who was thinking of making a complaint and was fearful, if you don't make that complaint, nothing will change. You'll, you'll go on living with whatever 
discomfort is, is caused to you by what you are seeing and not addressing. So that's the first thing. Nothing will change, and if you do make the complaint, then I'm pretty confident things will change. Um, secondly, there are protections. There are protections for reporters in my Act and also in the Public um, Disclosure Act. So by making contact with the OPI, uh, by phone or email or however, um, the reporter can be told about what those protections are and they can get some confidence that they will be protected. And, and if I learn that a reporter has been victimised within their agency, then I'll do something about it. You can rest assured, I will, I will address it. That cannot happen. We might move then to some of the questions from the audience. So the first question is, are you planning any reviews of the Act? Well, um, of course the Act is an Act of Parliament. So the scheme was set up under the previous Labor government, uh, I think the Wetherill government. Um, there was a lot of input into it at the time, but perhaps after seven years it's a good time for the government to review the Act. And I would expect to have some input into that. In, in fact, I have already spoken uh, several times to the Attorney General about what I see as the weaknesses in the Act and how it can be improved. Um, but of course, it's, it's the government's prerogative to change the Act as it sees fit. And all I can ask is that my uh, input and those of other people who are interested, um, and, and many people are, uh, th th that's taken into account. So it's not really for me to push uh, for a review, although I certainly do from time to time ask the attorney to address a particular problem that I see in the Act. Um, Treasurer's Instruction 28, which deals with financial management compliance program, is apparently under review. <laughs> and so the question being asked of you, Commissioner, is what would you like to see come out of this review to achieve better outcomes? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't bring it with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, I cannot comment on that, I'm sorry. I'm sure it's a, a very important question, but uh, I, ha I haven't looked at it. I'm not sure if the person who's asked that question is present. We do have a couple of microphones if anyone wants to provide any additional information about that. Otherwise, we, we might move on then. Do you think an agency's internal audit and risk team has an imp important role in upholding integrity and accountability? Oh, definitely. Of course it does. Uh, um, and I, I would like to see those teams communicate more with us and discuss what they plan to do and how they plan to do it and to get input from us, from our evaluations team, because they are the experts who, who can help. So, yes, the role is very important and we can help with it. Can you see a time where an agency might come to you and say, help, could you evaluate us? We've got some problems that we need some outside assistance with. And okay. would that be, I mean, is that, does that mean you're, that it's working, the function, if people see it as something good rather than something to fear? I would like to see that happen. I, I won't hold my breath. <laughs> but um, we find that Initially, agencies aren't all that happy about the prospect of being uh, uh, examined by us, but at the end of the process, and sometimes it takes months, uh, sometimes even longer, at the end of the process, they're generally really satisfied uh, with the outcome and, and eager to implement the um, changes we've recommended. And we've also noticed that, for instance, with the Playford Council, not only did the Playford Council pick up our recommendations, but other councils did too. And with Safe Work SA, we know that uh, the results of that evaluation have gone interstate and other interstate agencies, similar agencies, have adopted some of our recommendations as well. So there is a thirst for the sort of input that mm. we can give. So still on internal audit, what things can internal audit do better to strengthen organisational internal controls and improve management risk culture? Look, I think that's very uh, important, but I, I think it's general to the point where I can't really answer it. I mean, every internal audit section will be different and will have different strengths. But again, I'd say if, if there's a feeling within such a, a section that they're not quite sure where to go next, then help is available and they should take it. 
Okay. Why are so many investigations referred back to agencies who don't, and I quote, don't have the resources and skills to properly undertake them? And this person's calling out political matters especially. Uh, well, there are, as I mentioned, uh, around about 1,200 reports to the IPI every year. Um, and I'm, again, I'm leaving out uh, the police matters we deal with. So we, we cannot investigate um, all those matters. We, we choose the corruption matters. We don't even investigate all of those, we can't, but we refer some of those off to the police to investigate. Um, so we, we can't investigate all those matters, the maladministration and misconduct matters. The people who are best equipped to investigate them are people within the agency, although I recognise they often have to get in some sort of specialist investigator to conduct those investigations. And I appreciate that that's costly and um, perhaps disruptive. Uh, but that seems to me that has to happen. We keep oversight of those uh, investigations. As I mentioned, we generally direct how they should occur and we often get reports back if we think that's necessary. So we do um, keep an eye on them, but we can't investigate them ourselves. Some of them we send to the ombudsman, who, who has investigative uh, capabilities, of course, but uh, that's a lot of complaints to deal with. In terms of the political ones, um, not quite sure what that means. Um, we, we would never refer a corruption investigation back to an agency. That would always be conducted either by us or by the police. Um, so that wouldn't go back to an agency. Uh, if it was some sort of misconduct matter, it could. But we wouldn't really treat a, a political matter in any different way. Um, we look for the best way for it to be investigated and, and uh, dealt with. Turning then to proc procurement, What's your view on how we're currently achieving or demonstrating integrity and accountability through government procurement? Are there things that need to change or improve? Look, again, I just don't feel like I can answer that question. Um, it, it's not something I've looked closely at. It's a terribly important question, but uh, I, I can't give any informed answer to that. Okay. So somebody else has asked whether you have any views on Australia's declining ranking on the International Corruption Perception Index, particularly in comparison with our New Zealand neighbours. Ah. Well, I must say, I've always been impressed by our New Zealand neighbours. I, I think in the law, um, they are extraordinarily good. Their courts are fantastic for a small population they seem to punch above their weight, and they do that on a number of different spheres or platforms. So I'm not surprised to read that. Uh, I must admit I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, I don't think one could generalise in Australia. We have some states which have a much bigger corruption problem than we do, and uh, I suspect that in terms of Australia, we're uh, far better off than most other states. Do you think that most public servants understand their reporting obligations under the Act? Uh, I think they, they try to. I think the concept of having a reasonable suspicion is difficult for people. If, if you're a lawyer and you've worked in the law, you have a much better understanding of what that means. Um, some people think that you need proof of something in the form of a document or something you can hand over and say, well, here we are. Um, this is the basis of my reasonable suspicion. But, of course, that's not so. I mean, proof can be by oral evidence as well as by document or uh, other what we call real evidence. So a reasonable suspicion is just a suspicion that's based on reasonable grounds. It, it doesn't have to be a conviction. It certainly doesn't have to be um, certainty. So I think it isn't well understood what the uh, obligation is. And, and I think it's very important that people think more clearly that they're really, they're, it's only if they suspect something that they must report. It doesn't have to be any higher than a suspicion, but
but it must have a basis to it, some sort of reasonable basis. So it's perhaps a lower bar than public servants have understood. So, uh, hi Commissioner, says somebody. Um, are you considering a review of the threshold for the obligation on agencies to report misconduct or maladministration? Well, the short answer is no. Do you think the test is right? Uh, I, th I think so. I think reasonable suspicion is a, a good threshold. Mm. And do you find that sometimes people are overly cautious and report out of an abundance of caution? Yes, uh, I think no, I think it goes the other way. They're overly cautious and they think, well, I'm not too sure about this. I'm pretty sure it's happening, but I'm not certain, so I won't report. So I think we lose a lot of reports that should be made rather than getting a hold of reports that shouldn't be. So you'd prefer to get a report that you decide not to investigate than not get one at all? Yes, definitely, yeah. Um, you've said that you're unlikely to deal with maladministration matters. Therefore, are those referred to the Ombudsman or somewhere else? Yes, uh, they, they could either go back to the agency or they could go back to the, uh, go to the Ombudsman, either one. And somebody else would like you to outline the difference between your role as ICAC and the role of the Ombudsman. Well, I'm focused on corruption and the Ombudsman is focused on maladministration and misconduct, particularly maladministration. That's the essential difference. But because of uh, my uh, supervision of the OPI, I get to see all complaints. Even if the Ombudsman gets a complaint, he refers it to, to the OPI only for it to go back. But it's important that one agency sees all complaints in South Australia. It's very important intelligence that's gathered from that. So um, that, that's the division though, that we keep the corruption matters that we choose to keep and the rest go elsewhere. So the Ombudsman does very important work in that maladministration sphere. You talk about gathering intelligence through having oversight of all those complaints. What, what do you do with that intelligence? What benefit is there for you and therefore for the, for the public administration and you, you understanding the whole picture? Yes, well that's, that's a really important question and again it's something that I'm quite interested in. I don't think we've been doing quite enough with that intelligence. Um, we have been using it, uh, certainly, uh, we've built up a good body of intelligence and when we get a complaint in, we can see what other complaints we've had in the same agency, uh, perhaps in relation to the same sort of uh, uh, suggested corruption or maladministration. So we do draw on that intelligence and we also draw on it in terms of where we conduct our evaluations. We don't, we don't just um, stick a pin in uh, the map of South Australia and say, right, that's where we're going to go and evaluate, we actually target um, particular agencies. But I'm hoping we can do even more with that intelligence uh, and we're putting some steps in place to do that because I think it's valuable not just to us but uh, right across um, the public sector in South Australia. Uh, now I've got a question about the investigators in ICAC. What are the qualifications or experience that you're looking for in your investigators? And could you recommend to somebody, um, could you recommend to somebody who is considering change? I'm not sure if that means recommend that they come and work for you, or I think that's what they're asking. Well, we want uh, supremely intelligent people. <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, people with some experience, doesn't have to be in SAPOL, could be any investigative agency. Um, and we want people who are interested in the work we do. We have very sophisticated recruiting systems, of course, um, um, and we, we get a lot of applications from people uh, who want to be, become investigators. We've got quite a big team of investigators too, um, and we have very disparate a disparate range of experiences within that team. So uh, certainly I'd recommend it. I think working within anywhere in ICAC, I think is fantastic. Um, I think it gives people terrific skills and uh, they work under excellent leaders as far as I'm concerned. I'm not counting myself as that. They, they're all answerable to my directors, apart from my deputy and the director of investigations. And my directors are just exceptional a group of people. Some of the investigations you run, you run in conjunction with SAPOL. Mm. Well, 
Yes, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was going to say, could you maybe, I mean, I'm not sure that everyone would understand that. Could you maybe explain that a bit and do you think that works? Well, I haven't done that. There is provision in the Act for that to occur um, and theoretically that could work quite well, but I think there might always be uh, a little bit of tension about who's running the investigation. It would have to be me because that's uh, how it would work under the Act, but uh, I'm not sure that SAPOL particularly welcome joint in, uh, investigations and personally I don't see the sort of circumstances that would justify them. So. I'm not planning any, but never say never. You mentioned earlier weaknesses that you see in the ICAC Act. Um, can you lab elaborate on those weaknesses at all? Uh, well, I think it's a very hard act to um, absorb. I think if a non-lawyer or even a lawyer picked it up, I think they would need a lot of time to uh, consider it how the different parts of it work. So I, I don't think it's very user friendly. Um, for instance, it has about four schedules at the back. Um, some of those, one in particular, relates to um, uh, warrants and, and seizure of uh, materials. And I don't know why it's in a schedule. It should be in the Act itself. Um, the reviewer's function, I mentioned the reviewer earlier who oversees us and can access anything that we have really. Uh, his functions are set out in the uh, schedule, one of the schedules in the Act. It seems a bit untidy to me, as if perhaps it was lifted from somewhere else and placed into our Act. But um, that's one thing I would rectify. And then there are specific matters where there seems to be a bit of conflict, uh, and there shouldn't be, so things haven't been quite perfected, it seems to me, in, the, in terms of the drafting. But look, they're not terribly interesting matters in a sense. Um, they're quite small. I think the secrecy provisions are more difficult and certainly a wholesale reappraisal of those would be helpful, um, but it's difficult, as I said. Do you have any contact or are you uh, getting any lessons learned from interstate ICACs or the IBAC? Uh, I've started to have contact, um, of course it's early days, and I am going to Brisbane next month uh, to co-host a, a lobbying summit with um, the head of the Triple C up there and their integrity commissioner. So, um, and I understand we do all of the ICACs and IBACs get together every so often, but uh, that was apparently put off last year because of COVID. So. Certainly there is um, contact between uh, not just me, but also um, my deputy and uh, one or two of my directors with other agencies, and that's very valuable in terms of uh, sharing of information and experience. Mm. Someone's asked what the relationship is between your office and Irma's office, the Office of the Commissioner of Public Sector Employment, and do you work with um, Commissioner um, Ranieri to develop guidance for the public sector? Uh, well, we haven't yet. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't just uh, demand to, but uh, of course, um, Irma and I have met. Um, we met early on, and uh, we have a, an open relationship, and if, if there's something we could both work on together, of course we would, um, that, if that was seen to be valuable by Irma. What can be done by public sector employees to encourage reporting to ICAC? Uh, I think to talk about this concept of a reasonable suspicion, I think that's the best thing because, uh, as I said, it's not well understood. So I think having um, uh, lunchtime discussions about that or, or um, discussions over coffee would be good, just um, dispelling this idea that there has to be some sort of certainty before one reports something. Um, I, I think that's the, that's the best thing that could be done. Mm. You mentioned in your um, address the notion of ICAC being in partnership with public administration. Um, as a chief executive, I dread the envelope with the clear plastic <laughs> that comes and someone hands it to me and I sigh a little bit. Um, how do you, ch I mean, that's a cultural thing, isn't it? Do you have any views on how you make that shift 
towards partnership? That's inevitable, isn't it? Because, I mean, it happens really, of course, to you, Caroline. Very but rarely. <laughs> <laughs> but it's inevitable because it, that means more work and it means perhaps something's not working well. So, of course, you're going to dread that. Um, but, look, it is a partnership and I, I guess one has to remember at some point after the feeling of dread passes that if there is something that shouldn't be happening, happening, then this is a chance to address mm. it. I, I think it's the only way to rationalise it. Mm. I, I sympathise and I send out so many letters to uh, agency heads saying I want you to do this, 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 this and this. Uh, and I feel, oh, you know, they're, they're drowning in my letters, but um, it, they have to see it as a, a real opportunity, I think. But talking about it as an opportunity, I mean, I had a letter slid across a table by um, Commissioner Lander in relation to safe work, because when he embarked on his evaluation, safe work was part of the Attorney General's department. And I can say from my own experience that the um, director of safe work, Martin Campbell, was very keen to make a lot of organisational change. And he found it, it was a really hard slog. And now, on the other side of an evaluation and on the other side of a lot of change, without speaking for Martin, I think it's fair to say he feels that the evaluation is what made a lot of that change possible. Yes. Um, and yes. so maybe it's easy from the other side after the evaluation <laughs> to, to, to talk it up. But it, it is. It can be quite uh, um, a, a scary proposition of course embarking it, on an evaluation. Yeah, and I understand that. Um, I understand it and I, I don't think we can do much about that except that once it starts I think people realise that it's actually very valuable mm. and, and you know our people are uh, very charming people and, and they <laughs> soon win over anyone who's a bit resistant. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure what this question is getting at but I'll, I'll, I'll um, put it to you anyway Commissioner. What is your advice for assisting public officers to ensure that the same test of integrity and accountability is applied to all levels of staff? Yes, that's difficult. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, is it a matter of, of raising the issue and sending your uh, queries about that above? Uh, I mean, it's, it's basically an agency problem if that's not occurring. And I think the leaders have to be told if that's not occurring. And if they're deaf to that, then uh, perhaps a complaint needs to be made. But it, it, there's not, nothing is achieved by being quiet about it. It just eats away at one to see something happening that's not right or not fair or uh, lacks integrity. So talking about it is the first step, I think. You've touched on this already. But the question's asked, public officers are afraid of reporting corruption because they're concerned about being victimised um, and people are still afraid to come forward. Do you have any comments to make about that? Yeah, well, as I said, I think victimisation cannot be allowed to happen. So um, I've seen one instance of it and I reacted to it very strongly. Um, no, it, it mustn't happen. And again, uh, that instance involved someone who wrongly um, uh, published the fact of an, a report and because the agency was quite small, others were able to infer who had made the report. So it's, it's, it is very difficult, it's, it's a problem. Um, but again, uh, there are those protections I mentioned and where they're found to be insufficient, uh, I'll certainly address the issue. So I, I don't think I can say much more than that. And I think that's the end of our questions. That was the last question. Thank you very much. Um, look, please join me in thanking the Commissioner and Caroline Milo. Thank you. It was very, that's very good. I wanted to just mention that um, I've always had a very close working relationship with the ICAC, in particular with Bruce. Um, we started around the same time, I think it was, so I do look forward to working with you, Commissioner. And I think we've already organised some things in terms of further sessions, whether they are with smaller groups, to start to unpack some of the things 
that the Commissioner was talking about. So um, stay tuned. I think there's a lot more conversations to be had. Thank you everyone for coming today. It's lovely to see so many people in person and to those that are um, online. I want to thank our partners uh, that I mentioned earlier on. Um, please go to the IPA SA website for any further activities coming up. I think we've got a big year this year, haven't we, Renee? Um, we also would like to get your feedback on today's session and um, uh, so we can actually build on what you're looking for. Whether you have any ideas about future sessions, please let us know. I think it'd be great to see what you'd like to hear about. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today. Keep cool uh, and have a great day. Thank you.